Blog Talk Radio. Well, good morning. It's Blog Talk Radio, Interpreters of the Oracles of God. Hope everybody's doing awesome today. I call this one today, Building Yourself Up in Your Most Holy Faith. And we're going to be discussing the gift of tongues because it really is such a misunderstood gift. And I, the scripture that I, I used was from Jude one twenty. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. And, of course, there's something now interfering from my blog talk page here, so I'm going to check this out. In the meantime, I'm just going to keep going and try to figure out where that is coming from. And so we're going to... First of all, I'm going to uh, I'm going to declare Numbers 10:9. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpet, that you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and be saved from your enemies. I'm getting a reverb for some absolutely crazy reason too, and so. Let's play the song, the recording of the show part. Still getting reverb here, not understanding this. So let me go to my front page here. For those of you who are still on, if this continues, I'm going to shut down and start all over again. So I'm going to shut down and restart again. Okay, we should be we should be on. All right. So we're back in again. And sorry for that. There was reverb that I just didn't understand. So I felt it was just better to just start all over again and so I shut down and I don't hear the reverb so praise you Jesus and so here we go we're going to again I uh, I'm going to declare that again I'm going to declare uh 
I'm going to declare um, Numbers 10-9. Oh, here we go. When you go to war in your land against the adversary who attacks you, then you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets and be remembered before the Lord your God and be saved from every single one of your enemies. And so I'm going to play the recording of the shofar. <laughs> Lord Jesus, and so I want to, de- I want to, I never want to forget to thank IHOP Kansas for letting me use their music. I want to bless them. May the Lord bless them and keep them, and make His face to shine upon them, and give them His amazing, glorious, supernatural peace. And the two verses I want to use today for our prayer is in the Amplified Version of Ephesians 1, verses 17 and 18. For I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory, that he may grant us a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him by having the eyes of our hearts flooded with light so that we can know and understand the hope to which he has called us and how rich is his glorious inheritance in us, his saints, his set-apart ones. And I do have a caller, and so caller, I will, uh, it looks like you just want to listen. Um, I will check up with you in a little while after we do some of this teaching to see if you want prayer or anything like that. So I didn't forget about you and I see you there. Um, I want to talk about in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, in the Dewey Reigns, which is such an amazing version. It says, for in one, in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, whether bond or free, And in one spirit, I love how it says that, and in one spirit we have all been made to drink. You know, when we drink of the spirit, we receive from him his gifts, and he grows his fruits in us. And, of course, we can have all the gifts, but some people don't understand about the gifts. And so let's talk a little bit about 1 Corinthians 13 before we get started, because some people use this and think that the gifts are gone because of these this chapter i'm not going to go into the whole chapter i'm going to do pieces at a time and it says if i speak with tongues of men and angels but do not have love i have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal and this is uh, if i have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge and if i have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love I am nothing. And it goes on to talk about the different things. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Because, you know, works by love, does it not? And so this is in all things uh, in the word of God, in whatever we do. And we're not perfect, so we may fail. And we have to practice godliness, as we well know, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in 1 Corinthians 13, 8, 9, and 10, it says, Love never fails, but if there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. If there are tongues, they will cease. If there is knowledge, it will be done away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will be done away with. Well, who is the perfect? This is talking about, we do not need these in eternity, because the perfect is the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes back to take us into eternity. We won't need these things in eternity. It says for one, we're going to go in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, because people use that, that chapter and say, oh, all the gifts are done away with. Yet in the next chapter, uh, chapter uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it says this, pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. 
For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. Now here's one of the benefits of tongues. You're speaking to God. You're speaking mysteries in your spirit. The whole thing in this chapter was not to stop speaking in tongues, but that he wanted all who did not have the gifts to be edified. He called them ungifted. In 1 Corinthians 14, 3, it says, For one who prophesies to, speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. One who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but one who prophesies edifies the church. So keep that in mind, because what did it say? What, what did it say when we just read? It's building up that person themselves, but the other people aren't being edified. And this was all about, you know, in the church, in the assembly. Paul wanted everyone to be edified. And so doesn't that go right with the title that I titled it? <laughs> Building yourselves up in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Because that's what, when you pray in the spirit, you build yourself up. And there's nothing wrong with building yourself up. But in the, in this assembly, Paul wanted the whole, all the people edified. And so think of this. The Corinthians didn't use, use the gifts of the spirit the way they were supposed to. They abused them. And so Paul wanted them to know that they were supposed to be done with love. You know, some were looked down on if they didn't have the gift. Some used it to be showy. And so Paul was bringing correction. Remember, again, faith works by love. What was the motive of Jesus when he healed or delivered? It was compassion. And if the gifts aren't used with the compassion of Jesus and to testify of him, then the motives aren't pure. You know, many times, we see today the gifts are abused. I feel partially because people lack the training. Let's look at some of the let's look at some of the verses in one Corinthians fourteen explaining some things about tongues. For one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands. Now is there something wrong with speaking to God in your spirit? No, of course not. But this person who was doing it is speaking specifically to God, and they're being edified. And that's beautiful and powerful. In their spirit, they're speaking mysteries. But as he said, 1 Corinthians 14, 4, one who speaks in tongues edifies himself. You know, what did you say? Praying in the Holy Spirit builds you up in your most holy faith. Because if if you pray in the Spirit, if you have your devotional tongues, you know that you can pray and stir up the gifts. God might wake you up in the middle of the night and tell you to pray in the spirit because you might be praying for a missionary in Africa. You don't know. But it's a beautiful gift. It can be used for intercession. It's the language of the spirit. Does not every country have their own language? Well, what about God? He has his own language too. You know, Let's talk about this in 1 Corinthians 14, 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What is the outcome then? I will pray with the spirit, and I will pray with the mind also. I will sing with the spirit, and I will sing with the mind also. Last night, I was got together with a, a person that I mentor, and we went over this a little bit, and she said, what does that mean exactly? And I said, well, let me demonstrate to you. And so I'm going to demonstrate with, to you also, for those who don't pray in the Spirit, what that means. Because say you're saying, oh, I praise you, Lord Jesus. I love you. Lord, I lift up, oh, I'll just make up a name. I lift up Mary, Lord. And I send the word into her to heal her and deliver her from all destruction. Lord, your word says in Isaiah 53 that by your wounds we are healed. Now, Maybe the Lord will say, all right, now I want you to pray in the Spirit. And so I'm going to demonstrate that for you, to pray for Mary. You see what I'm saying? So I can pray with my mind, which would be like, thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for healing Mary. I believe your word. By your wounds, 
she was healed. And then I can pray in the spirit. Do you see where I'm coming from here? So you can pray in the spirit and you can pray in the mind. You can sing in the spirit and you can sing with the mind also. And I want to demonstrate a little bit of that, not by me singing, because you probably wouldn't be very happy. And so I'm going to use uh, some of the uh, singing in the, it's called Singing in the Spirit from IHOP to demonstrate how beautiful it sounds when people pray in their heavenly language and they sing. So here's some singing in the spirit. Maybe it's holy, holy, holy. So you can sing holy, holy, holy. And then the spirit, you might want to sing in the spirit. I think you get my message. So you can sing in the spirit and you can sing in the natural. You can pray in the spirit and you can pray in the natural. It's so beautiful. It's so supernatural. But is it everything? about God supernatural I mean you're you're being born from above being born again isn't that pretty natural or healing or deliverance everything about God is supernatural because he is supernatural and so uh, in in 1 Corinthians 14 22 and 23 it says so then signs so then tongues are for a sign not to those who believe but to unbelievers, the prophecy is for a sign not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all, and all speak in tongues and ungifted, now I want you to remember that word, ungifted, men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're mad? Very likely they will, because they don't even understand anything about God for that matter. And so I wanted to, uh, I looked up some of the conco- uh, the concordances, and so I wanted to read to you uh, commentary critical and explanatory on, on the whole Bible unabridged on that specific uh, verse. They say, wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Thus, from Isaiah, it appears that tongues uninterpreted, uninterpreted are not a sign for believers, though at the conversion of Cornelius and the Gentiles with him, tongues were vouchsafed to confirm their faith. Now you're going to have to go in there and read Acts 10, but it's such a powerful chapter. And I always tease people because I'm Italian, and I'm like, hey, the first, the first uh, Gentile believer was an Italian. And so they received the gift of the spirit 
the baptism in the Holy Spirit, just as Peter and the apostles did, and they were stunned. So you'll have to go in there and read that. And it says, so the tongues condemned those who rejected the preferred gospel on Pentecost. And it gives scriptures, yet they will not hear me. Um, 1 Corinthians 14, 21, even primitive signs fail to arouse them. A sign is often used for condemnatory sign. Since they will not understand, they shall not understand. And if you want to look up that, that is uh, the commentary critical. Now there's another one, Wedden's commentary on the Bible. And this is on uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 22 through 25. Tongues assigned to them that believe not. Their miraculous and startling character rendered them a sign for the conviction of unbelievers, just as the Assyrian tongues were for the bringing Israel to repentance. For the conviction of unbelievers were the charismatic tongues intended, and this they would often effect if rightly exercised. The notion of some commentators that Paul teaches that tongues are a sign for judgment upon incorrigible unbelievers is contrary to the whole history and character of the charism, and entirely unsustained by Paul's, Paul's words. The Pentecostal tongues, though rejected by the mockers, were intended to convert all who heard them and did affect the object to a glorious in- extent. The charism, by its very nature, points to a reception of the gospel by the nations. If they are a doombration, which I had to look up that word because I was clueless, it means foreshadowing of the one tongue of paradise. They are a cheerful and glorious image. By their appealing to the ear of the foreigner in his own home dialect, as well as by their thrilling supernatural impressiveness, they were a sign most convincing to the unbeliever, just as Paul says the signs of an apostle were wrought by him for the conversion of the Corinthians themselves. Yet all happy results depended upon their proper use. Otherwise, unbelievers will reject those, displaying them as mad, as in the next verse. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all, called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. And you know that if a believer or an unbeliever alike gets an accurate prophecy and they speak something to someone that will just absolutely, only that person and God knew, they will, their heart will be so open and they will give thanks. And I just saw that a couple weeks ago when a man, um, when a man was spoken to prophetically I received a word for him, and he rededicated his life to Jesus because this is a word that he needed to hear, and it was something that him and God were discussing. And so, you know, in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, it says, I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. However, in the church, I desire to speak five words with my mind so that I may instruct others also rather than 10,000 words in a tongue. And so what is he saying here? He, love, he He's not telling you not to speak in tongues. He loves speaking in tongues. Yet in the church, he wants all edified because if the ungifted come in, they're not going to be able to understand. Is there anything wrong with tongues? Uh, no. <laughs> Obviously not. It's a sign. <laughs> so the big thing about 1 Corinthians was order. And if you go in 1 Corinthians 1440, it says, but all things must be done properly and in an orderly manner. You know, Jesus had to be filled with the Spirit too. Then the apostles, and then Gentile, the first Gentile believers, and then from there on people received. Jesus and the apostles uh, were sent to make sure they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. I can hear you saying, what? That's right. Let's make sure what I'm saying is written in the word of God. My opinion doesn't matter. My traditions don't matter. The only thing that matters is this, to rightly divide the word of truth. It's okay if you haven't received the revelation yet. You will because if you're asking, 
seeking and knocking, he is not going to give you a scorpion, a devil. He's your heavenly father. We have to believe that God is more powerful than the devil, don't we? In Acts uh, 19, verse 1, I'm just going to read, and I read this all the time because I feel it's so important because it shows the baptisms, plural, which if you read in Hebrews, it talks about the baptisms, plural. Now listen to what happened here. It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no, we we haven't even heard there is Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. And so Paul goes on to teach them. He says, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. Well, there was their salvation. And when Paul had laid hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking with tongues and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. And so, obviously, how did they know that they were baptized in the Holy Spirit? Well, they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. And so... That was 12 more, irregardless of the apostles. Here were 12 more men. And if you go back, they, uh, you know, Jesus takes the apostles with them and gives them authority. And then he sends out 70 more. And, of course, that was just the beginning. The book of Acts was to show us the act, how to act, <laughs> how it all worked. And so I want to show you uh, in the Amplified, we were talking about 1 Corinthians 13 before, And I'm going to start at verse 8. Love never fails, never fades out, or becomes obsolete, or comes to an end. As for prophecy, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, it will be fulfilled and pass away. As for tongues, they will be destroyed and cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. It will lose its value and be superseded by truth. For our knowledge is fragmentary, incomplete, and imperfect. And our prophecy and our teaching is fragmentary, incomplete, and perfect. But when the complete and perfect co- perfect total comes, the incomplete and imperfect will vanish away, become antiquated, void, and superseded. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now that I have become a man, I am done away with childish ways and have put them aside. Or now we are looking in a mirror that gives only a dim, blurred reflection of reality, as in a riddle or enigma. But when, but then when perfection comes, we shall see in reality and face to face. And what is? Think about who are we going to be face to? Who are we going to see face to face? And and it says now. I know in part imperfectly, but then I shall know and understand fully and clearly, even in the same manner as I have been fully and clearly known and understood. Isn't that beautiful? Because we're going to see Jesus face to face someday. And then we're going to know the whole. And so uh, I'm going to skip some of my stuff because, of course, I'm going to run out of time as usual. And so we're going to go look in Acts 8.14. They had received the word of God. And check to see what was said here. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. I'm not going to really talk about Simon the sorcerer this time, because I want to make the point about uh, tongues and prophecy and and what happens when we're baptized in the Spirit and what the Bible has to say about it, not people's opinions. You know, think about what Jesus said. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me as the scripture said, not as somebody's opinion said, 
not as somebody's tradition says. No, it's as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. That rivers of living water, once we receive salvation, is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And he says in the next verse, but this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And I am not saying that people are not saved if they do not have the gift of tongues. What I am saying is it's part of a separate, like we read in Acts 19, it's a separate thing, a beautiful thing, because it's a person. It's the immersion in the Holy Spirit. And remember what John said in Matthew 3.11, as for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And this word baptize here, I love it. It's uh, in 907, and it means the coolest things ever. It means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge a vessel sunk, to make clean with water, to wash oneself, to bathe, to overwhelm. Isn't that beautiful? To overwhelm. It's so gorgeous. He wants to overwhelm us. He wants to immerse us in who he is. And I want to read this, not to be confused with bapto. The clearest example that shows the meaning of baptizo is a text from the Greek poet and physician Nicander, who lived about 200 B.C., Listen to this. This is so fun. And then you will know why people talk about getting pickles. It's a recipe for making pickles. And it's helpful because it uses both words. The canner says that in order to make a pickle, the vegetables should be first dipped, bapto, into boiling water, and then baptized in the vinegar solution. Both verbs concern the immersing of vegetables in a solution. But the first is temporary. The second, the act of baptizing, The vegetable produces a permanent change. When used in the New Testament, this word more often refers to our union and identification with Christ than to our water baptism. Mark 16, 16, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Christ is saying that mere intellectual assent is not enough. There must be a union with him, a real change like the vegetable in the pickle. I love that. So let's get pickled, huh? Let's get immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to see if the listener wants to pray or anything, and then we'll continue in this, and I'll find that out. If they don't, I'll know. Oh, they hung up. So obviously they don't. (laughs) All right, so continue on then. Think about, I want to go back to uh, and review 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. Because remember the chapter before, many people use that to to say that the gifts have, have been done away with. Yet that can't be true because in the next chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, it says, Paul says, pursue love, but strive eagerly for the spiritual gift. So he's not saying tongues are bad, but that they that they speak to God, they utter mysteries in the spirit. And what in heaven's name is wrong with that? <laughs> Paul in verse three is saying that if a person prophesies, they are building others up, encouraging, consoling others. Uh, other versions say uplifting, edifying, and comforting. In verse four, he's saying that the one who speaks in tongues edifies himself. But the one who prophesies builds up the church. In Jude verse 20, it says, But you, beloved, build yourselves up in your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, Paul says, Now I should like all you to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. Keeping in mind, he's talking about in the church, not in private. Because remember, when you pray in tongues, you speak mysteries to God in the Spirit. But in 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 Chapter 14, he's talking about order, but he wants the whole church to be edified. That's what this is all about, the good of the whole corporate body. That's why in verse 6 he's saying, I'm 
speaking to you in tongues, not in prophecy or instruction or revelation. In other words, the, those who those who are in human language and you'll understand it. But if it's a heavenly language, without the interpretation, you plainly won't get it. And there's a variety. And I want you to also remember this. And I did a, a study about this. There are varieties of tongues. You have a prayer language. You can pray in the spirit from morning till night if you want. It stirs up the gifts. It brings revelation. It brings wisdom. It it, it stirs up the gifts that 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 uh, your devotional, your devotional tongues. There's the one that happened at at uh, in the book of Acts where they heard everybody speaking their languages. That must have been incredible. And so obviously that wasn't in the church. <laughs> that was on the streets. And of course there's this gift here which. If you ever were in a church and someone prays very loudly in tongues, there must be an interpreter, interpreter, and that is the gift of tongues they're talking about. Remembering, again, there are varieties of tongues, okay? And so you have your prayer language where you can pray in the spirit hours and hours. It's so beautiful. And so um, remember again, they're talking about uh, the, la- the different languages all over the world, that none is destitute of meaning. But if we don't know the language, we'll be clueless. So in verse 12 and 13, he's saying, pray for the gift of interpretation as well as the gift of tongues itself. And this is the specific gift I was just telling you about. And so Paul is explaining in verse 14 and 15 that if they pray in an unknown tongue, in the, in the Amplified, it says, my spirit, the Holy Spirit within me prays, but my mind is unproductive, and it doesn't edify the whole church. It says, my spirit, the Holy Spirit within me. Do you see how beautiful that is? And so I will pray with my spirit by the Holy Spirit within me, but I will also pray intelligently with my mind and understanding, and I kind of demonstrated that to you before. So you can sing with the spirit and human words, and you can pray in the spirit and with human words. And remember what it said, that they're building themselves up in their most holy faith, praying in the spirit. And so the gift of tongues and being baptized in the Holy Spirit is probably one of the most the, the most amazing events that ever happened to me in my life. And if you're out there and you say, I want I want to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. There's a place on my page where you can actually write me and I can I'll pray I'll I'll pray next week. I'll pray on the show for you to receive the Holy Spirit because the only prerequisite is that you're born from above, that you've repented and that you're born again. And then you can see the kingdom of God and receive all the things of the kingdom of God. So look in Acts 2, verse 38. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Isn't that awesome? You see, Peter says receive. Here's another thing. You have to receive it. God's not going to zap you. You have to receive. Just like you receive salvation, you have to receive the Holy Spirit. And so you see, Peter says, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promise is for you and your children. And, of course, in Acts 19, we saw that they were baptized. Of course, John's baptism was repentance. Being baptized in the name of Jesus was salvation. And when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> they prophesied and spoke in tongues. Isn't that beautiful? So those are some of the manifestations when the gift of the Holy, when the baptism in the Holy Spirit happens. And so we ran out of time, but next week we're going to talk about what led up to the day of Pentecost and what happened. And of course, we know there was an outpouring, and so we're going to get into that next week. Because we all have, that's our inheritance. I, I, I want everybody to receive their inheritance and their destinies. So I pray 
that you join me next week, and I'm going to play a most beautiful song by Misty Edwards, just a couple minutes of it. She's praying spontaneously in the spirit, and it's so beautiful. So thank you for joining me, and I pray you join me next week. And sorry for what happened at the beginning. Um, just was out of my control. So here we go, Missy Edwards, Spontaneous Worship. God bless you. See you next week. Thank mm-hmm. you.